Hello, and welcome back to the Manufacturing Culture Podcast, where we dive deep into the stories and strategies shaping the manufacturing industry's future. I'm your host, Jim Mayer, and I'm thrilled to have you join us for another exciting episode. Before we jump into today's conversation, I want to remind you to check us out at Manufacturing. Don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok for the latest updates, insights, and behind the scenes look at our podcast journey. This month is a special one on the Manufacturing Culture Podcast. We're focusing on the theme of software driving cultural change talking to leaders from innovative organizations about the transformative impact they're having in the world of manufacturing. It's all about exploring how technology is reshaping the industry, not just in operations, but in the very culture of our workplaces. And speaking of transformative impact, I'm incredibly excited to introduce our guest today, Vivek Kumar. Vivek is the CEO and co-founder of TeamForce AI, an employee intelligence platform doing groundbreaking work in an unlocking team member potential in manufacturing. TeamForce AI is all about amplifying the voice on the front line and tying this back to measurable business outcomes, which we will hopefully explore a little bit today. Vivek's journey to the forefront of tech innovation and manufacturing is absolutely fascinating. Before he ventured into the world of technology startups, he honed his skills. He gained valuable experience at the Blackstone, Blackstone Group and Katzenbach Partners, now part of Strategy and. With a solid foundation in economics from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania and co-authorship of two issued patents and innovative prowess to the table. But Vivek's story doesn't stop there. He's not just a tech innovator. He's also a family man living in San Francisco with his wife and their infant son. Balancing the demands of leading a cutting-edge tech company with the joys and challenges of fatherhood is no small feat, and it's a testament to Vivek's dedication and passion for making a difference. So buckle up, listeners. We're about to dive into a conversation that will inspire, inform, and ignite your imagination. We'll explore how Team Force AI is revolutionizing the manufacturing industry, the role of software in driving cultural change, and Vivek's personal journey that has led him to where he is today. Let's get this conversation started. Hello, Vivek. Welcome to the Manufacturing Culture Podcast. How are you doing today, my friend? Doing well. Thank you, Jim, for having me. Uh, thanks for being here, bud. We, we've we talked about this for, I don't know, maybe eight or nine months at this point. Uh, you caught me right as I was going into these different themes. So, uh, you know, it didn't work earlier, but man, I am so excited to, to get this going, talking about software, talking about the way that we can leverage software to make really big changes within our organization. This is going to be a great conversation. I'm pr pretty pumped for it. Same. All right. Yeah, awesome. So Vivek, uh, tell us your story. I, this is how every guest starts on the podcast. Uh, we we want to hear your story. How did you get from Wharton School to Team Force AI? I mean, and even before then, if anything shaped your journey before Wharton, tell us your story. Yeah, so I um, graduated Wharton undergrad in 2007 and uh, worked in the corporate world for a couple of years, initially at a management consulting firm that was spun out of some McKinsey folks called uh, Katzenbach Partners, as you mentioned, and it's now owned by PwC Strategy. And I also worked at Blackstone, which is a large alternative asset manager. I was in the credit division there and out of school. And at that point in time, things were going well for me in, in the corporate world, but um, had a little bit of a bug or niche to try things in, in startups and uh, ventured off into that path, had done a couple different things, initially spent a number of years in India where there was a goal around increasing internet access in the world's largest democracy. And the way we were doing that was by monetizing public Wi-Fi hotspots. So mm -hmm. you would watch, say, a 30-second advertisement to get 30 minutes of free Wi-Fi. And you've got to remember... This is when there were low internet penetration rates in India. There was no 4G, 3G. I mean, this was this was a different era than we're familiar with today. Sure. And we we like this idea of natural interaction and, and trading your time, you know, for for a brief ad to get free internet. And we were doing that for a while. Worked with some large brand advertisers, Google in India, Jabong, Cadbury, HDFC Bank, Cisco. 
but that wasn't going to be that big of a business for various reasons. B2B SaaS in India selling domestically was just a bit of a challenging market, kind of 2012, 2015 time. We then focused on monetizing or kind of helping uh, hotels improve their internet guest Wi-Fi experience. So I remember a vivid conversation with an advertiser who said, hey, you know, you've got this ad, but what happens if someone has a poor internet experience? I don't want to be responsible for for that poor experience tied to my brand name. Mm. And as part of that guest Wi-Fi experience, we had a thing on the login page where you could rate your experience at the hotel. Mm. So you, you know, everyone goes to a hotel, they stay at a, you know, they log in with their computer or phone and they often connect to the Wi-Fi. And there's, it's called the captive portal. One of our uh, clients had said, you know, when someone's logging in, I want them to rate their stay and I want to get the information in real time. Because what happens today is they don't tell me or at the checkout or after fact, they leave a review on Google or TripAdvisor. Or they tell me that, and it's too late. They yeah. can't solve the problem. And th this was pretty interesting. We ended up um, doing this in the U.S. motel, hotel market, mostly like one to two star hotels. Again, bigger business, but it wasn't going to be a huge business. So we were selling to independent motels, hotels, and some franchises as well. We could never kind of crack, say, a corporate wide chain. Sure. So the genesis of what was previously Click It and, and what we launched as Team Force actually came in a customer discovery conversation. So I don't have a background in manufacturing and I have a ton of respect for people who've been in the industry a number of years who invite us in to even be able to present why we can maybe be helpful to them in some way. But the discovery was actually talking with someone. He's um, had about a Fortune 1 who, who initially was actually on the supply chain side, distribution side, now actually today works in manufacturing at another large enterprise. And he said, you know, Vivek, this is really interesting what you have in the hotel space. Um, and we had also done some things around HR desktop apps. But he said, you know, I'm going to tell you my number one pain. I hire 150,000 package handlers a year. And by the end of the year, I have an entirely new workforce. <laughs> and I can't retain them. And I've thought about wages. And we can talk about that. Um, but, you know, what else can I do? And I, I really like your thought in this hotel environment because you've made this a natural feedback. You've made it fun and easy and not an additional step. Also, these people don't sit behind computers, so they can't, they can't necessarily use that same flow. Can you figure out a way, though, to make this kind of natural, fun interaction that's meaningful for, for the people completing it and to give me the insights and intelligence while people are still at my organization? And this conversation was in 2000, and it's actually what led us on this path. And he said, if you can solve this problem for me, there are many others that have the same kind of problem. And, and lo and behold, he was right. And so that, you know, we, that was the third version of Click It that I was describing this long arc. And then eventually us launching and founding Team Force in late 2022, where today we make it super easy to collect feedback in the natural flow of work for people who don't sit behind a computer, primarily in manufacturing, supply chain, logistics, healthcare, and retail. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I love your, I think it's your tagline. Uh, it's employee engagement solution for the deskless workforce, right? Or it's something along those lines. And I love, I love that concept, right? Because in manufacturing, a very small percentage, logistics, other skilled trades, a very small percentage of people actually sit at a desk all day, right? But they're moving through a facility. Talk to us about the the actual uh, kiosk itself, Team Force itself, and, and where where does it go within a facility, and how does it operate? Yeah, so from that story, we started to think about how like, first principles. What's the best way to solve this problem? And a number of people, as you talked about, they would say, oh, I've got sophisticated survey software with PhDs on staff who know how to write the perfect question with no bias and randomized. That's, that's phenomenal. That's great. Um, they're all a wonderful mobile app or an SMS or texting capability. Great. There are valid reasons to utilize those systems. But as you allude to, Jim, um, for people who don't sit behind a desk, which is 80% of the workforce globally, and it's a large wow. contingency, you know, percentage of the... Um, workforce in uh, manufacturing, you know, how do you engage with these people? How do you actually get them to want to tell you? Because the most common scenario isn't people coming up and complaining or writing this. It's actually them saying nothing. You, right. you have no idea what's happening. 
And um, so in this first principles approach, we, we thought about in this idea of the tablet, you know, you, you see these in airport restrooms asking you, how are you? They have smiley faces. It wasn't necessarily what we sort of picked up on as, oh, okay, you're doing it in an airport. Let's do this here. But it made sense seeing that. And so we said, okay, we have a little bit of a background in hardware and software dealing with Wi-Fi. We're not uncomfortable with having an on-prem kind of component. And so we started tinkering with the tablet or the kiosk mechanism. And we found over time, especially that it tended to be the right medium. And it tended to be the right medium because we would stick these tablets, think near time clocks, break rooms, and restrooms, which are in your natural flow of work. Um, you have fun, different types of content that can be put up there each day. And it's completely anonymous, other than we know what location the response came in from and what time it came in from, but we don't have anything uniquely identified to anyone. If you compare that, say, to a mobile, which is often your own device, or you mm -hmm. have to put it in a locker, it creates a notification. It can clearly be traced back to you with identifiers on the phone, IP addresses, cookies, this idea of something in the flow that has interesting questions and also just, you know, there's a visual, oh, I'm kind of curious, could I learn something today? It, 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 it clearly drove higher engagement. And when you, when you drive that higher engagement in terms of defining it as response rates, you start to be able to uncover more intelligence for employers on key things that they're looking to affect. And you're also providing value to the employees because they're choosing to go interact with this, just as they could choose to sure. interact with the QR code or engage at a town hall or a focus group or walk into HR, whatever it may be, or answer on, on, on their phone. They're choosing yeah. to kind of go up to this. And so that first principles, sort of what led us to the tablet and how it works a little bit today. So what kind of questions are on there? I mean, you, you kind of walk through a different, a couple of different scenarios, learning and, and questions. And so what, what kind of content goes on to these tablets? Yeah, it's, it's anything and everything. And it's actually very much dependent on what the organization wants to ask about. We've seen everything from questions around safety, questions around what's the first language you learn to speak? How long is your commute? What do you wow. think of the equipment, managers, coworkers, growth and development? Who's going to win the big game tonight? Trivia about company history, uh, DE&I type questions. The world is your oyster. Um, sure. What it really comes down to is how receptive is the organization and leadership to getting information uh, from their workforce? in a sure. way that they feel like they want it and can react to it. And, and, and the most dynamic organizations are quite receptive, both to, in terms of the questions they ask, showcasing results, real time circling back about actions or decisions they're making as announcements, and uh, really creating this, this flywheel of, hey, we value your feedback, you're important to us, uh, and here's, here's you know, what we're thinking as an organization and how we're gonna respond and, and making it much more of a team and community rather than perhaps more hierarchical. I'm the boss, you're the worker, you do as I say, and if you don't, there's no room for you. And that that culture dynamic has changed, especially uh, with COVID and, and the demographic changes in the labor sure. force. And so it, it's created some opportunities for us to, to learn from this demographic about the things that they value and that they yeah. really want. And the most interesting thing is that Everyone assumes if you ask people what they want, they want more money. Well, everyone would appreciate more money. <laughs> really, everyone wants to be paid fairly and competitively Absolutely. for the work that they're doing. And so long as your wages are competitive, then it becomes about everything else. What else do you got? And for some reason, you know, in, in, in the workforce for people who are deskbound, who sit behind laptops and computers, over time, we've become comfortable with this idea, okay, let's... Let's enhance that environment and, sure. and you know, let's have really cool amenities on site, massages, you know, fancy water in the break room, you know, foosball meat, you know, tables. Exactly. Right. <laughs> and when we think about people who are working in environments like in manufacturing and warehousing where there might not even be windows and it's hot, the idea of even having to cater to those ideas of how we can enhance it for some seems so novel, which is just crazy. Yeah. Given that if we go back to the, the workforce, well, we know in manufacturing, usually 50 to 95% of the people don't sit behind desks all day. Right. And we know that the highest level of employee turnover 
And the number of the highest you know, percentage of safety accidents occurs with people actually on the production floor. Yeah. So if, if that's where the, and, and when we measure productivity, it's often those people as well. If, yeah. if those are all true and those are the metrics we're looking at, and we've got so many metrics around what a machine is going to break. Uh, but we, we, if you ask someone, what's your greatest asset? What's your greatest investment? Or what's your greatest expense on your income? It's my people, my salary. Okay, it's, yep. it's your labor, right? If that's true, and you're telling me you have sensors on, on your machine, but you don't even know about your people who are coming in each day. Yeah. It sounds like there's a pretty big gap, a blind spot there. Wouldn't you like to know if you could implement a few small things regularly and make those changes and let them feel valued and heard? You could actually have a pretty large impact on some of those things like around turnover, safety, and productivity. And, th and those are often metrics we help solve with the types of content that we put on the screen. So who creates that content, Vivek? It varies by organization size in the plan. In the enterprise, almost always we're creating that content. We do have more uh, economic type options as well, where they can work with partners like yourself or directly and create their own content. Yeah. Um, what we really focus on are measurable outcomes and goals, quantitatively right. and qualitatively. You know, yeah. one of the, the things with cultures, people often say, okay, culture, how do I measure what's really happening? And we can talk about some examples of this. But what we say is, trust us on the process, because we mm -hmm. do this regularly for a host of different clients, that we can work with you to achieve what your key goals and outcomes are. All we ask is you're upfront with us about your outcomes and goals, that you're transparent throughout the process on how those are changing and how we may be affecting them. And that where you're uncomfortable with something or you, you may not agree, we'll work within our bounds to try to make it work for your organization and you. But again, we, we've seen a process be successful with this kind of thing. And uh, and those that follow it and, 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 and do well with it, I mean, we can talk about some examples, but they've, they've seen success. Again, it's not as if people don't think about this. If you don't give them the opportunity to express what's in their head, it doesn't just disappear. They will vocalize it to their peers. They will go online. They won't show up to work the next day. They'll get involved in an accident. They won't be, it, it exists. Your goal yeah. should be to uncover it and then think about what action to take, not to put your head under a rug and close your ears and ignore yeah. it. And so that's really what we help organizations do. And by doing this, by the way, you help build better bonds with your workforce that prevents a lot of issues from even you know, coming up in the first place. So again, we work with organizations of different sizes to really awesome. help focus on their goals. So uh, you mentioned in an in earlier uh, answer, you, you talked a little bit about results and this was, you know, ultimately a results driven platform, I think is what you said. Uh, what is the impact that you're seeing? We, companies that are using TeamForce, what kind of results are they seeing and what, what is the impact within a facility? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, what I'd like to do um, is I'm going to actually share my screen and talk a little bit about this one at a third party research level. And then secondly, some anecdotes and, and findings from some of our own customers. So let me go ahead and if it's okay, Jim, um, for those of you who are listening on audio only, I'll actually describe it as well. So you can see what's um, on our screens firsthand. But let me uh, skip. Here we go. So hitting share screen, here we go. Okay, so for those of you following along on the video perspective, I'm, I'm sharing an article. This was in the Los Angeles Times. You can find it online. It was in September of 2023. It's one of my favorite articles because it says, think getting a, a raise from the boss is hard. Try asking for this. For some executives, there's something harder to part with than money, a say in workplace decisions. It goes on and it talks about uh, an Amazon fulfillment worker who's making $22.95 an hour and she gets a 25 cent pay bump. And while she wishes she earned more money, her bigger frustration is this. Whenever she makes a suggestion about how work should get done, she's invariably dismissed by management. It can't hmm. possibly be a good idea if it's coming from an entry level employee. Yeah. It goes on and talk about this idea of a voice gap. A lot, a lot hmm. of people are familiar with the idea of a voice gap. Everyone's probably heard of the pay gap, right? Pay gap. Absolutely. Voice gap. And it then in that same article cites some research by Gallup that talks about 
that in the typical organization, only about three in 10 people believe that their opinion matters. But if organizations got that number up to six in 10, Gallup has estimated and found through their research that organizations can experience a 27% reduction in turnover, a 40% wow. decrease in safety-related incidents, and wow. a 12% uptick in productivity. Now, those aren't our stats because you could say, hey, Team Force, yeah. you know, you're an early-stage startup that's doing well and growing, but, but you're, not, you're not Gallup. What right. is Gallup saying? <laughs> yeah. And that, that's a game changer. And those are some massive numbers too. I mean, that's not a couple of percentage reduction in turnover. It's not a couple of points of, of increase in productivity. That Those are some massive numbers. Those are some massive numbers. And those are only covering one of the two dimensions that we offer. So when we think of Team Force, we offer employers intelligence and we offer employees voice. What Gallup just cited was voice that people yeah. believe their opinions matter. It didn't say anything about employers actually thinking about implementing changes and solutions. Now, there should be sure. some you know, assumption that if your opinions matter, people <laughs> are at least reacting to it to some degree. Right. But it, it doesn't kind of go into the details of now that I have the intelligence, you know, what do I need to actually do? What are the solutions that, that are most effective? And the, the analogy I like to use is, when you go out to dinner, Jim, there's probably a correlation between the establishments that come over to your table and say, hey, Jim, how is everything? And them being better establishments. Yeah. Would you say so, right? The fact Absolutely. that we even cared. Yeah. They're not going to ask if it's if they're not interested and it's not a good experience because right. by simply asking, you indicate that you care and you value that person. And while you may not be able to make it perfect in the moment, you strive to make it as like positive for them as you can. Yeah. Now take that same way of thinking in the workplace. You've worked so hard to find the talent that you have. You've trained this talent. You believe this talent is good, especially if you found recruited, trained. You've, you've ultimately decided to hire this person and ideally they're a fit for your organization. If you've done all those things, but once they're in the door, you don't actually think about saying, wait, you know, I, I, I brought you in because I valued whatever you had to offer. The least I could do beyond, you know, providing you competitive wages and benefits is to understand what are you seeing on the ground level? Yeah. And, and, and that voice component is so powerful for the findings, but also to that person to say, you actually matter. And, and I value your opinion, just yeah. like in that restaurant example. I don't just want your money for the meal. I care about what you think about how the experience is going. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And I mean, that's true because not every restaurant takes feedback from every table back to the chef and says, hey, uh, table 12 said that X, Y, and Z. It's the perception from the dining side, right? It's it, even if no change happens from that feedback, you still feel like your voice mattered, right? Um, and, and again, I agree with you. I'm not saying companies shouldn't act on this information. I do employee engagement surveys all the time. And, and typically uh, the, the companies who don't act on the data are the ones who then see further engagement dives after uh, those surveys are completed and, and people are seeing no action taken, right? People want that action uh, to be part of what it can mean to them in, in providing it. But it can be the low-hanging stuff. It doesn't have to be massive, massive, uh, large-scale changes. It could be, uh, I put an extra fan uh, on the floor, right? If, if that's part of the feedback. It, it, it's, it can be incremental and, and small in nature, but at least people are feeling hurt. Yeah, and it can actually be real things that matter to people that are net neutral in cost to the company and could even be beneficial. Let's not talk about that. Yeah. We've had uh, examples where someone in the workforce has said, hey, you know, our default is a 30 minute unpaid lunch. What if we did 45 minute unpaid lunch and we agree to stay 15 minutes later? It's all real mm. stuff I'm talking about. The company says, you know, it requires a little bit of a schedule change, but it's, it's a net neutral thing. You're doing the same amount of work. It just, mm -hmm. you know, we're changing some schedules. Okay. We can accommodate that. Let's ask, let's ask everyone. And so yeah. they did and they gave them the options and then the, they allowed the workforce in real time to also see the results to this poll. 
Now, the workforce overwhelmingly, about three quarters, suggested, you know, actually, let's keep it at 30 minutes. And yeah. you know, with Team Force, you can see the data by hour. And we have some ways to prevent duplicate responses. And we can talk about integrity of the data if anyone's interested um, afterwards. But, but our customers, they, they know we have some systems in place. Um, and when they, they show the results in real time, not only did they do that, which is hugely powerful because you can see your vote matters, but they, a week later, said, you know, uh, we asked you all about this. You as a collective unit, as a community, as a team, said you want to keep it at 30 minutes on paid yeah. lunch. And so we are not going to be implementing that change right now. And we have on the tablets the capability to provide free text feedback. Think of it like a digital suggestion box. Okay. And the people started writing, great feedback. Thank you for following through. Like, Wow, I, I, I took a survey and you actually circled back to share the result with me. Right. And so I say this example because it highlights a few things. One is just because you're asking about a change, what might require some minor deviation as you're talking about, this, this is net neutral on a larger scale basis for the company. Sure. It's the same amount of work that's occurring, but it actually could matter a lot to somebody, to that individual who suggested the idea. Their idea was brought up to their entire unit multiple shifts in the same facility. And while that wasn't something that the majority of people wanted, they know that it was heard, their voice mattered. Sure. And so if we get back to those metrics we were just talking about, this is an instance where the company thought about whether it should implement it. It was at least an interesting enough idea to present to the workforce. They presented it and ultimately the workforce said, as a unit, we don't want that change. And so it didn't make the change. And and it's not to say, you know, could they implement flexible schedule? There's alternatives they could do. But I, I highlight this example to say that that's an example of voice mm -hmm. where someone feels like they're heard, but just because the change didn't occur doesn't mean that the company isn't valuing what they have to say. And yeah. so what the company did really well is they showed results in real time and after they allowed people to vote, obviously, but then they also circled back by doing an announcement indicating why they were making the decision they're making. How many organizations do you know, Jim, that would literally do a survey, which everyone would say, wow, my, my idea made it at least to the survey phase. Yeah. Take the results and never circle back. And it would be, oh, the results indicated people didn't want the change. So we didn't make the change. Oh, did, did you not even communicate that? Did people not even know? All how do we time. know you're not lying about you? Know, so that whole process of voice yeah. People take for granted and they neglect it. They're like, ah, you know, there was no change that are... the process of people feeling like they're heard is actually yeah. what Gallup was alluding to, irrespective of the intelligence and the ultimate decision. And that's that's super important. Does that make sense? Absolutely. It makes it makes complete sense. So, uh, Vivica, I, I, and I, I think this segues pretty nicely uh, because we're talking about the voice of, of humans, right? But we're also talking about utilizing a technology platform to capture that voice, right? A and we talk on this podcast sometimes about uh, how part of building that culture that a company desires is... Uh, part of that is having the right tools on the shop floor, whether that's software or hardware or, or cutting tools or whatever the case may be. Talk to us about how you see software like TeamForce, like like your platform, uh, and maybe even outside of that employee experience engagement type platform. How do you see technology and software being able to drive that cultural change within this industry? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it, is this idea that people want to feel safe to provide that level of feedback. So if someone says, hey, you know, Vivek, we've got a family-oriented manufacturing culture where everyone knows everyone. Great, sure. understand, respect that. Um, usually what we find is they tend to be organizations that say aren't as large as some really large enterprises. And we've always done it this way. In fact, we have such a great culture, Vivek, that anybody can come up and tell me anything. Yeah. Wonderful. Do you remember what it's like to be in someone's shoes who could face retaliation for being honest with you, no matter how great of a person you are? I mean, to, to actually understand the uh, dynamic, the power dynamic that exists in, in yeah. almost every you know workplace culture, there, there needs to be mechanisms where it's okay to go up to someone and mention something. That's fine. But there, there's also other moments where you want to be able to provide feedback and it to be truly anonymous. 
And yeah. so we provide software that not only makes it fun and engaging and there's knowledge and learning and development, there is that key component to be able to say, here's what's truly on my mind and take it or leave it. But before most people end up even turning over, they, they actually want to indicate to the organization, and I'm not going to cite any names publicly, but what we all hear about in the news, oftentimes, even with whistleblowers, is not people not wanting to, to vocalize. The people working on the production floor want to actually do what's right. Yeah. But the mechanisms by the company may make it challenging to provide that opportunity to do the right thing. Yeah. And we just fill that gap for those companies that would prefer to have the intelligence directly in-house. What we're simply saying is, would you prefer to have a more direct line of communication with yeah. your workforce? We enable that to happen as a more effective medium, perhaps, than, than some others that may exist today. So Vivek, what is the the biggest challenge? Because this is a novel approach, right? This isn't something that, I mean, the technology has been there, right? I, I haven't walked into a bathroom in an airport in a long time without seeing the technology. But in this industry, this is a novel, novel idea, novel experience. So what are some of the ch biggest challenges that you faced getting TeamForce implemented in, in this kind of technology into the manufacturing sector? Yeah, from a... Company perspective as an early stage startup, our biggest challenge is we don't have a well-known name today. So we tend to do very well when we get at-bats and opportunities. We actually end up closing a higher percentage than, say, typical benchmarks if we get in front of the right folks. Yeah. But we don't get enough at-bats. And, and so that's, that's a Team 4 specific dynamic. When we think about the industry, manufacturing obviously is not maybe as, as fast moving as say technology I'm based in San Francisco, very sure. rapid adoption of newer technologies that happen quite quickly. The pace of that, what it's, what it's sort of forced us to do and learn is that one of our assumptions was, oh, we should go target manufacturers that have a pain or problem around high employee turnover, or, or maybe those that are having labor relations issues, because we could come in and we could really be a good problem solver. Yeah. But what we've learned is you can't simply target companies with just a pain or a problem. You've got to focus on companies that, number one, truly value their people from an organizational and or people level as a decision maker. Because yeah. if they don't value their people, no matter how much evidence you present, no matter how many solutions you can solve, they don't want to actually solve that fundamental problem of, of hearing from their people and getting that intelligence. And so- yeah. That that uh, segmenting and targeting as we think about early adopters uh, and forward thinking manufacturers who want a competitive advantage, they are the ones that see the most value and benefit the most from our solution. And our hope is eventually the, the market more broadly uh, realizes the value of this. The analogy I like to use is I, I remember interviewing um, somebody who who's spent many years in the surveying space. And he would say to me, you know, Vivek, before the, the modern surveys that we're all used to taking online, there were paper and pencil surveys. And it was actually a novel concept to even survey your people annually. You know, hmm. yeah. I, I, I pay these people. Why would I want their opinions? Literally to do an yeah. annual survey. And now yes. you'd be like, name an organization that doesn't even do an annual survey. So it's become very commonplace to do an annual survey. Yeah. And it's actually become more commonplace in, in other industries to do poll space surveying, to do it more regularly than annually. Absolutely. I think what we're saying is, you know, and, and the research indicates the workforce wants to provide feedback more regularly. Do you want to provide that mechanism for them to have that feedback, uh, to provide that feedback to you? And so that's really what, what we're feeling. And so we tend to focus on organizations that want it. That's it. We agree there's a, a gap. And wow, here's how much we could benefit by solving this gap. This makes a ton of sense unless we want to solve the problem. Yeah. Um, but there, there, you know, sadly today, still a number of organizations that are not ready to actually solve sure. the problem that maybe have some antiquated ways of thinking and they will sort of remain in the status quo until they're ready to yeah. fundamentally solve the problem um, that, we can, that we can help solve. 
Awesome. Well, and in full disclosure to the listeners, uh, Team Force and and I have partnered, and and uh, so if anybody out there is listening and says, "Hey, uh, I want to take advantage of this, but I don't know where to start," uh, reach out to me. Uh, if you uh, go with a Team Force solution, I'll throw you guys my employee engagement survey uh, as part of a, a package, just so you then have data that you can use in real time to create uh, better survey questions, better pull survey questions. You can take the employee engagement survey and, and run with that on, on Team Force. So uh, very happy and proud to, to be partnered with Team Force and Vivek here. Uh, Vivek, uh, We've talked about some challenges. We've talked about the platform uh, with the rise of AI and the the I mean, industry 4.0 is here. It's not something that's coming in the future. It's here. Uh, how do you envision the future of manufacturing? What's next for the industry and, and what role will platforms like Team Force play in that future of, of the industry? You hit on something I think about a lot, and <laughs> I'm probably not the right person to answer this. I have more curiosity and questions than answers, but I will say being based in the San Francisco Bay Area, where we are inundated with AI talk every day, we're in, in Hayes Valley, which is known as Cerebral Valley informally now, and it's literally one of the epicenters of AI. Yeah. And it's constantly on the mind. So what is going to happen? What I can you know, say from our perspective at Team Force is uh, for at least the near term future and what we can imagine for right now. There's still going to be a place for humans in manufacturing and in the environments we're talking about. Now, how can the will the nature of work change? May there be fewer people doing what we're used to seeing people do today? Yeah, that's a real possibility. Will there still be people on that production floor, at least again, in, in the more near medium term? Yes, it seems that way. Um, I, I'm probably I probably think about this more than than most of my peers in the startup space manufacturing. I'd love to get your take, Jim. Um, and none of our customers, by the way, ever sort of at this current stage, bring this up as, as anything that they're saying, sure. hey, Vivek, we've got these robots coming. We, will, we don't want to get intel from our people because we're going to replace all our people. But uh, what do you think, Jim, with all of this stuff? And where do you see things going, especially given your background in, in manufacturing and culture? So as we start to look at the skills gap in manufacturing and we look at the amount of baby boomers who are retiring and leaving jobs that are highly manual in nature and we don't have enough gen xers like myself millennials i believe that like you uh and gen zers like you know the jacob sanchez's of the world um to really backfill those positions i see our education system needing to pivot to teach people more how to program robots, how to, right? And so we need to invest more in some of those technical skills versus the actual manual labor, which we can start to program robots to do, right? Uh, we can use machine tending to load and unload parts and start CNC machines. Uh, we need to train that next generation of, of manufacturers to uh, start to adopt and, and be able to program those robots. Does that make sense? It does. You know, the, the, the interesting thing is it seems, and again, don't know all the details, that there's less of a need in coding some of these day-to-day, -day, now maybe not up front, than, than historically. Now, all that said, if you look at the data, the number of robots sold in the U.S. in 2023 is down year over year from 2022, which I found astounding. Like, I, yeah. I have no idea. So it, it's really hard to predict to know where things are going. I do want to let the audience know from an AI perspective, we see AI as a co-pilot and as an enabler and a helper for people. And the way we see it is around three things. One is to analyze all the data we help collect because we collect so much data. Number two is to provide recommendations or solutions mm -hmm. based on the data that's coming in, this proprietary data from your workforce while they're still there. And number three is to help create more content based on the data and things that your workforce finds interesting they want to talk more about and yeah. hopefully you're open to asking about. So those are those are productivity gains and ways to help everyone benefit. We are not thinking of AI in a more dark sense or sense of dramatically changing 
the nature of people's work day to day today. Yeah. Um, so I, I, it's I did not want to Skynet. Sure. Yeah, it's not Skynet, Terminator. I wrote all that stuff. So uh, I, I know when you would ask me, I sort of I went with where my head truly when I'm I'm walking and thinking about that because of where I'm based. It is yeah. so kind of uh, just all the time on the mind. But um, when I'm visiting our customers, truly I'm focused on solving their pains and challenges for the here and now yeah. and the people they have working and not the what could be. It's, right. it's what is and, and yeah. solving those. So well, because um, they think... have very real problems right now, and and that kind of touches on something that you just uh, talked about, Vivek is is that uh, you know the robotics sales have gone down, and I think that lends to the the concept of of the the workforce automation paradox, right? So the workforce automation paradox is this idea that culturally a lot of these corporations these manufacturing entities especially when 80 percent or something like that are uh, under a hundred employees in in this country right so the the bulk of smaller companies in in this uh country may not culturally be ready for robotics may not culturally be ready for automation right and so i think that we're going to see those kinds of plateaus and even drops in robotic sales until that paradox normals out. And I think what's going to take to happen to, to see that is we're going to have to see a lot of generational changeover of leadership in these organizations. I think that, uh, again, as a baby boomer generation retires, as uh, the older Gen Xers, uh, not myself, but people in that Gen X that are uh, on the older side, as they start to retire, we're going to see leaders from uh, the millennial generation, from Gen Z, step into place. And that's where we're really going to see the, that robotics and, and automation really start to take off. And we'll see less of the, the pl uh, plateauing and, and even drops as, as we saw from 22 to 23. Yeah, that's a really good point on things that happen out here that are often too early and 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 that cultural appropriateness at the right time to be able to have something be successful. The, the rate of change is so high right now and it seems to be getting faster and faster, Yeah, but is society ready for all of those changes? And, Absolutely. and uh, you know, do they even want all those changes? You know, that, that's, th those are questions that are really existential in some ways and how we form societies and all that. And, and, and not to go down that road too much, but for the here and now, and the way we think about AI and, and, and work is, is really to just make it more beneficial for yeah. everyone involved. Absolutely. Uh, Vivek, as we wrap up here, uh, what's next for Team Force, for Vivek? And also, what kind of knowledge bomb? I, I always ask my guests if there's something that, they, that I didn't ask that they want to share with the audience. So what's next for you and Team Force? And what didn't I ask you in our conversation today? Yeah, uh, what's next is we just want to keep growing and delighting our customers, um, you know, get, get the flywheel of the business really going. We're really fortunate to serve some of the brands and logos. And for those of you listening, you know, please feel free to contact Jim or me if you want to learn more, if you just have feedback or thoughts. Yeah. Um, from an, an example perspective, I liked, uh, you were asking earlier, Jim, about metrics and, and some of the things, just what I was hitting on to elaborate. And I know we don't have a ton of time here, but uh, I did want to say there are, when we think about getting people on record to to talk about some of these things is also sometimes challenging companies don't want to publicly talk about these things yeah. openly, but I'll share another example of how a company can solve some of these problems, even if they never wanted to use us. And, and hopefully if they find it helpful, they think about ways to utilize us, but let's take safety for an example. We, um, we have a scenario where maybe you have a, a manufacturing organization. You're like, you know, I really want to bring my safety numbers down. I have a seemingly high number of safety related incidents in one of my facilities and um you know how how would i go about doing that how could team force or something like what jim offers with culture solve that problem mm -hmm. and it's interesting when you talk to the typical general man uh, general manager in manufacturing what the response is is we need to ask more safety questions through the kiosk and we need to ask different questions and get more detailed and, and, and that all makes sense that's true but what we have found is that sometimes the idea of solving a safety-related incident in terms of the number of, of innocents that occur 
isn't related to a lack of knowledge on safety. It's related to not following safety protocols because your workforce doesn't understand why they need to actually do that. And I say that sure. in the sense of safety, is that, is that a management problem? Is that a workforce problem or is that a collective problem? Mm -hmm. Because your workforce might not be following those protocols because they're trying to meet a production goal, or they might get reprimanded if they have to spend a bunch of time and, and talk about or write up something related to safety, how they, they couldn't hit a goal because they had to, to go do something that took longer. So in one of these environments, someone had suggested one of the workers to, to someone we know, why don't at the next company picnic to help solve safety, we film the children and spouses of this mostly male dominated environment we're talking about in one of these facilities. Why don't we film them talking about how important it is that their father comes home each night? So they actually did this. They, they filmed at the company picnic. The man saying, you know, uh, the, the children saying, I love how my daddy makes me Superman or Superwoman. I love how my daddy plays ball with me each night. I love how my spouse comes home and, and hugs me and tells me he loves me. And they had their names as well. And they played the videos in the break room, these men in this environment. And um, they started tearing up and, and they started to realize that, hey, you know, I'm not just dealing with, say, Jim in this instance. I, I realize Jim has kids and he's he's got a, a wife. He has his family that yeah. if I spill, say, that hazardous material and instead of attempting to quickly clean it up, I'm going to do the right thing, not because I should be doing it for compliance or I'm going to get reprimanded if I don't, but because I care about Jim and the people that Jim needs to get home to. And yeah. that motivates me to do the right thing. And when they actually implemented you know, th th this cultural component in, in um, this environment, the number of safety related incidents went practically to zero. Why should I want to know what my workforce has to say? Well, the workforce provided the idea. The workforce collectively worked with you to solve the problem. The benefit accrued heavily to management and the shareholders, as well as the workforce by actually creating a safe work environment. and. Everyone in, in, in a collective worked together to make everything better. Yeah. And so I want to paint that picture that instead of thinking of asking your workforce about issues that they're going to have negative things to say and they're going to troll you, think of them as actually teammates that want to collectively solve a problem and identify what motivates them. Yeah. We found studies, and take no offense to those on the podcast, that sometimes Beyond the paycheck, people aren't motivated by management or hitting metrics. They're right. motivated by coworkers and recognition. Sure. And so if that happens to be true in your environment, instead of being frustrated that they don't care about management, realize that if, if their coworkers are the ones motivating them, find ways for them to care about their coworkers, like we're talking about with safety, to hit the goals and metrics that benefit you. Yeah. And those are ways with, you know, Jim, you do your your um, culture assessment and yep. team force. We have our, 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 our software and the tablet that in combination can help you do this at scale Absolutely. on our regular methodical process driven basis. Absolutely. So I hope, you know, that additional example really paints the picture that this isn't just feel good stuff. There are yeah. real business benefits around providing that voice and getting that intelligence and following this process where you can create a best-in-class culture that will outperform your peers in ways you haven't even already thought about. I love it. I love it. Thank you, Vivek. I appreciate you being on today. Folks, that's a wrap. What an absolutely amazing conversation with Vivek today. We've explored the transformative role of software and manufacturing, highlighting how platforms like TeamForce AI are revolutionary, revolutionizing team dynamics and driving cultural change. Journey's, uh, Vivek's journey itself is absolutely wild. And, and I love the story coming from Wharton into uh, software startups. Uh, folks, thank you for joining us on this episode of the Manufacturing Culture Podcast. For more stories and insights, check out our website at manufacturingculturepodcast.com and follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. We'd love your support in spreading the word about this podcast. If you found today's episode valuable, please share it with your friends, your colleagues, boss, 
even your grandma, anyone who might enjoy it. And please don't forget to rate and review us on whatever platform you're watching or listening to it on. Uh, it helps us reach more listeners. It rockets us up the charts, which means more people find us. And it helps us then deliver more great content. Thanks again for tuning in, everybody. Until next time, keep pushing boundaries of manufacturing innovation. Have a great day. Keep making things. Bye.